Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our Goldrum Lecture. Um, many of you will know that, that um, Goldrum Lectures are part of the Harlixton experience and they are something that, that we put on for the students in our normal semesters and, and for you as summer school visiting students are allowed uh, that have your own um, Goldrum Lectures. Um, this evening, um, I'm very pleased to be able to welcome Rob Griffin to, Griffith to our Goldroom Lecture. Um, some of you will already know uh, Rob he, uh, from the University of Evansville, where he's the Chair of Creative Writing Programme. Um, at Evansville, he also fulfills many other roles. As a teacher, he's been awarded the University of Evansville Outstanding Professor Award. He's also an Associate Director of the University of Evansville Press. He's the founding editor of the journal Measure, an annual review of formal poetry, and he's the managing editor of Measure Press, as well as being the director of the Harlexton Summer Writing Programme. So he's a very busy man. And once being uh, fulfilling all of these roles at Harlexton, at um, Evansville, he's also managed to find the time to become a very accomplished and critically important prize-winning poet. Um, He's published four collections of poetry, has one um, at the press waiting to come out in the autumn, or as you would say, the fall, um, and is busy here at Harlexton at the moment um, on sabbatical writing um, his, next, his next collection. Poetry has been described as deeply moving, mature and memorable, and of a kind we've not seen since Auden. So, Tonight, uh, Rob, Rob is here, and he's going to do some readings for us um, from his book that's going to be coming out in the fall. Is that right? Mainly so. Mainly so. And maybe talking a little bit about the, the creative writing process. So, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Rob Griffith. Can you guys hear me okay in the back as well? Okay. Um, I, I want to start by just saying uh, thank you to Jerry and Nicola and Ed especially for setting this up. Um, I love coming to Harlexton. Uh, it's always a fantastic experience whether you're a student or a faculty member. And I, I'm here this time kind of on a sabbatical just doing, just doing writing. So it's a, it's a different experience for me this time, but it's, it's been hugely productive. And I want to thank everybody else for coming out tonight. I know there's plenty of competing activities, um, and so I appreciate you guys being here to listen. I, I'm going to read a little bit from my previous book, a few from um, the book that's coming out in the fall, and I'm going to read some that I've actually been working on while I'm here this summer. But before I do that, I, I kind of feel obligated um, in, in a good way to, to, to read a poem um, a friend suggested to me. Uh, to kind of at least address the, the elephant in the room, which is the Manchester bombing the other night. Um, when these things happen, I think they hit us sometimes in pretty unexpected ways. And one thing that I've found um, helps me quite a bit is to return to some of these touchstone poems that, that talk about these kinds of things. So I'm actually going to start with a poem that I didn't write. Um, it's called Dirge Without Music, and it's by Edna St. Vincent Millay. I am not resigned to the shutting away of loving hearts in the hard ground. So it is, and so it will be. For so it has been, time out of mind. Into the darkness they go, the wise and the lovely. Crowned with lilies and with laurel they go, but I am not resigned. Lovers and thinkers, into the earth with you. Be one with the dull, the indiscriminate dust, a fragment of what you felt, of what you knew, a formula, a phrase remains, but the best is lost. The answers quick and keen, the honest look, the laughter, the love, they are gone. They are gone to feed the roses. Elegant and curled is the blossom, fragrant is the blossom, I know but I do not approve. More precious was the light in your eyes than all the roses in the world. Down, down, down into the darkness of the grave, gently they go, the beautiful, the tender, the kind. Quietly they go, the intelligent, the witty, the brave. I know, but I do not approve. 
and I am not resigned. Thanks for, for letting me do that one. Um, I, I think like a lot of us, I'm, I'm kind of processing what happened the other night as well. And I, I tried to kind of shift my reading tonight accordingly. Um, I've got some serious pieces in here and I'm gonna read them, but I've weighted more of the playlist tonight towards some light poetry because I think I, I need that and I don't know, I, I'm imagining we all could use a little bit of that. So this first one's a little bit lighter and it's mine. Um, for those of you who know me, or those of you who've had me in class, you know that I'm nearly deaf and I have two problems. One is obviously I can't hear very well. And the other problem is, is that when I do hear things, I hear them in the most salacious, dirty way possible. Um, so that gets me into trouble with my wife all the time. Uh, so this one's kind of autobiographical. And it's called, For a Husband Going Deaf. Bird-like, he tips his head from left to right, but knows he heard it wrong. Among the bins of apples, pears, and grapes, there's little chance his wife had palmed a tomato and said, you plump young Cato, so sick with sin. Likewise, at church on Sunday, he's pretty sure the preacher hadn't risen, spread his arms, and blessed the congregation with a cryptic, your meat is bun ready. Go forth and cockfight. <laughs> the words, like worlds with orbits too elliptic, fall into outer darkness, a cold expanse where meaning cannot follow. And his wife, uncharmed by his ceaseless bafflement, shakes her head and mutters, Gabriel shave me, distend a cure. <laughs> and this one's kind of on the borderline um, <clears throat> between funny and pathetic, um, which is kind of a, a nutshell description of my life. Um, but when uh, I've been married now for 14 years, almost 15, and uh, you'd think I would learn some things by now, but no, I'm a man, and that doesn't happen. Um, but one of them is, is that every night, um, my wife will sit in bed and bow her head, and <laughs> inevitably, two or three minutes into this, I will go, are you okay? And she'll be like, I'm praying, shut up. <laughs> so this is about that, it's called Each Night. You sit in bed, back bowed like a fishing pole, taut against a heavy catch. The pose is one I always mistake for sorrow, pain, or despair. I touch your arm, cool and smooth, and ask, what's wrong? You surface slowly, shedding the dark water of your prayer, before opening your eyes and smiling archly. You'd think I'd know by now that every night you take your small boat out to the deep waters and cast your line. And all the while, I pace the shingle, ignoring the lap and click of waves against the stones, ignoring all that moonlight trembling on the bay. Instead, I watch for that black wake that signals your return. And a little lighter. Um, I am unhealthily obsessed with horror movies, especially zombie movies, apocalyptic kinds of stuff. And if you're like me, uh, which I really hope you're not for your own sake, um, but if you are, it's hard to watch these things and not kind of put yourself in the protagonist's position and think, what would I do you know, if this happened to me? If I were at Harlickson, it was overrun by zombies. You're thinking about it now. Okay, so you know where the food is. <laughs> so this is when the zombies come. I'll be ready. I've seen the films and know that when the dead stand up and brush the dust from coats and once bright shoes, you need a plan. In bed, I lie awake and plot escapes, an attic filled with guns and cans of soup, the basement stacked with flats of bottled water, batteries and jerry cans of gas. And if they come too quickly and catch us in the night, I'll barricade the bedroom door, wake my wife and scramble out the window. We'll ride the roof's soft hip, the zombies' low moans, a flood that billows and breaks against the house. In time, of course, they'll win. What happens then when all the brains are eaten? 
When all of us are rooted out of cellar and bomb shelter, when all the razor wire is down and all the army base is overrun, what then? I like to think they'll mill and stare, then bend to take up all our uniforms, our jobs and lives. A zombie checkout boy who sacks the bread and eggs. A zombie line ref who shambles downfield to make the same bad calls. And zombie teachers gurgling out declensions for lie and lay. And at a desk, paused with pen in hand, a zombie poet writes a sonnet for his zombie love. He sings a flawless gray skin of eyes like curdled milk. And then is a last one from this previous book that I wrote. Um, it's a little more serious, and it's a persona poem. Uh, so it's from the point of view of an, American, an early American theologian named Jonathan Edwards, who some of you may have had to study. Sinners in the hands of an angry God, that kind of thing, which is maybe not the best representation of, of who he was as a, a writer and a, a person. Um, but this one may have some bearing on, on this week as well. So it's called Jonathan Edwards at the River, and it actually starts with an epigraph from Edwards from one of his essays where he says, here is lively represented how all things tend to one, even to God, the boundless ocean. The sky grows light and lightens more with goldfinch song among the trees. The notes so bright, they leave me heart sore to walk this path of haloed green. The river, too, uncoils its force and levers up silt and stone, churns them in its milky course, a lathe to shape inconstant earth until the only thing we know is change and loss, as if the point to everything is letting go of time and all it sweeps away. But this is wrong. The river bursts through mountain rock, scores plain and bog, till all those waters so long dispersed convene again in boundless seas. And there, beneath a blue resolve, the rivers merge until each drop, like souls returned to God, dissolves into the ocean's salty heart. Our deliquescing selves, awash in sun, embrace a long oblivion. So I'm going to read now some stuff from the book that's coming out in uh, September, um, which is called The Devil in the Milk, and you're all now obligated to buy because you're here, and I'm making eye contact. Um, we're, we're photographing you now. Uh, this will be charged to your, your Amazon account. And a large portion of this book, um, oh, it's going to be so popular. It's about a sixth century Irish saint. Um, and. Uh, you know, nobody can get enough of that. Um, so it's about St. Columba, also known as St. Columkill. And he was an Irish uh, monk who basically, he was one of the first of what they called the white martyrs. And in the sixth century, he and some others basically uh, put themselves in these little boats called coracles. And they didn't have oars, they didn't have sails, and they pushed off from shore and they trusted that God would take them where they were supposed to go. Um, Columba himself ended up on a little island called Iona, which is just off a larger island um, called Mull, and this is off of Scotland. And he established a monastery there that actually became really, really important over the next hundred years or so. And from there, Christianity kind of re-expanded across northern Britain. Um, and it's a, it's a pretty fascinating story, but the part that I really am most interested in is this as a metaphor, you know, how we end up where we are in our lives and how we process that. Are we here where we are at this particular moment in time, you in school, me at my job, et cetera, because there's a purpose to it, there's a design, or is it purposeless? And that, in fact, is something we have to deal with, too. So I've got a lot of poems, I'm not going to read a whole bunch of them, I'll read a few um, that are either about or from St. Columba's point of view uh, dealing with some of this. So the first one is called Arriving, and as you can guess, it's just about him arriving in 565 on Iona, and it starts with a, an epigraph from Bede, um, from his Ecclesiastical History of England, 
And Bede says, in the year of our Lord, 565, there came into Britain a famous priest and abbot, a monk by habit and life, whose name was Columba, to preach the word of God. Arriving is the hardest part. The work spread out, barren as this shingle, this rough skirt surrounding nothing but a bit of green turf, a gull-swept sky, and the angel-empty air. In this clamoring silence of breakers, birds, and surf, I kneel and wet the hem of my robe. Now is the time for invocations, for prayers to fill this empty space with words made flesh. Yet to be are the mortared stones, the joists of English oak, the quarried marble, green as the hills of Donegal. But soon, God willing, foundations will be laid, the faithful will come, and hymns will rise, solid as vaults and spires, limpid as the clear story of heaven. So one of my favorite stories about Columba, um, and I've got a few in the book, and this one actually comes from um, another monk called Adamnan, who about a generation later wrote a history of Columba. And one of the most famous stories is actually about the Loch Ness Monster. And um, in this story, Adamnan details the miracle of how Columba, who did travel around Scotland quite a bit to, uh, to evangelize, um, he was on what is now Loch Ness, and he was preaching, and the monster appeared, crawled onto shore, and he basically took his staff, and he smacked the monster on the head, and it scurried off back into the water. So it's also one of the earliest accounts of the Loch Ness Monster, too, which is kind of cool. So this is St. Columba and the Serpent. Gray as slate, the lock is still again. The serpent's glistening bulk sunk fathoms deep by quiet words and gestures of the cross. The roiling waters calmed by God's gravid name. In the hush, waves lap the stony beach and a charm of green finches carol in the ponds. But soon this tableau breaks as awe gives way to joy. These heathens start to dance and shout, forgetting fear Forgetting the fisherman, their friend, who lies beside his boat, a mound of bloody meat and chaff. Forgetting, too, the beast that prowls their shared and purblind dark. Despite the summer heat, Columbus shudders. How long before the serpent turns for shore, before it comes again with tooth and claw to rake the bones of men? And who will stand? <coughs> Nearby, a boy sits in the dark and stares. He sees the failing light, the midge-fuzzed sky, the ashen nimbus round the saint's bowed head. I'll make this the last of the Columbo poems. Um, I'm obsessed with him, but it doesn't mean you guys have to be, obviously. <laughs> um, but some of these are, they're, like I said, they're from his point of view. And this one is Columba in older age. And, I've got to imagine that saint or not, like all of us, he's going to have his doubts about God, about the way the universe works, about his place in the universe. And as he gets older, obviously, this might become more apparent. So this is Columba expresses his doubts. Dawn light hovers in the architraves and ghosts the narthex, nave, and altar, gray as storm-tossed December seas. Matin sung, a silence rings from stone to stone, the cold and barren fact of the world made plain in every shadow, every line. Outside, the gulls are wheeling, cruciform above the sound, then plunging like angels of God to the dark ways below. Broken fish hang limply from their beaks, an arid sign to those with eyes to see. Still on his knees, Columba prays, if you do not exist, then we are less than this indifferent sky, this small and rocky place. And yet, he thinks, we might be more. For who invented grace? What hand directs forgiveness if not ours? In the rising light, the gulls break oysters on the shore. They tug the tortured flesh from shells, their discordant cries oblique and lonely lauds. Okay, a, a little bit lighter one. I, I, I promised to do more of those, and then I had several about a 
thousand year old dead saint questioning his faith in God. Um, hilarious, I know. Um, so this one, it, it sounds, the title sounds like it's going to be religious, and it has some religious elements. It's called Crusade. Um, and this one's also, I don't do a lot of autobiographical poetry, so it's weird that I've picked a few tonight that are. But this one, I, I had an enemy. Um, and he was my neighbor uh, on my street. And his name was Sid. And he was about 80-something years old. And when we moved in, Sid made my wife's life a living hell for the first two weeks. He didn't come over and say, hi, neighbor, or anything else. The first day we moved in, he called and yelled at my wife about bringing the garbage can in. Um, so, you know, the last poem talked about forgiveness. I'm not big on that. Uh, so I went on a crusade against him, and I won. Um, and this step is about, this poem is about that. Sitting on my front steps, awash in sun, I drink my tea and watch the neighbor's house. Two Mormon missionaries, ties as black and thin as the exclamation point at the end of Jesus, knock then smile as old Sid Peterson emerges. Too far away to hear their words, I shade my eyes and watch their pantomime. A pamphlet, scowls, then clenched fists and soundless howls as Sid waves them off his lawn. He's shaking now, a scrap of paper trembled by the wind. But who can blame him? All morning long, he's had a steady stream of visitors, the ardent faithful bringing him the news of Christ, of Krishna, Moses, Buddha, a world of promises and light he knows is false. He turns to go inside. I should confess, I called them all, but I can't bring myself to seek an absolution for my sins. So I really did that. I spent one day calling every religious organization in town and I uh, told them my name was Sid and that I would like a personal visit to talk about the Word of God. <laughs> and I scheduled them all for the same morning and then I sat on my porch and I watched them show up. <laughs> I'm not a nice man. I'm just a little creative and evil. So this next one, it's also a little lighter. Um, and for those of you who've read Hamlet, you'll, you'll probably get more out of this, I think. There's a couple of lines that are pinched directly from the play. Um, but what this is based on, basically, is, and some of you may already know this, but in the 19th century, weirdly, there was a tradition, at least in the late 19th century, of portraying Hamlet on stage as overweight. And which is weird to the modern audience, I think. But there's a couple of lines that are, you know, there's some textual evidence for it, but I think they're misreadings. You know, he'll, he'll say, you know, let this too solid flesh melt, and people are like, oh, he must be fat. Um, so this started with that, and then it kind of got knocked home when I learned a new German word, which I will now mispronounce. Um, it's called Kummerspeck, or Kummerspeck. Does anybody know this? And what it means is excess weight gained from emotional overeating, which I love that the Germans have a word for that. They've got a word for everything. And it literally means grief bacon, um, <laughs> which I think is awesome, because I want some grief bacon in my fridge. Um, so this poem is about Hamlet, and it's called Fat Hamlet. Mother says I'm fat and scant of breath that I'm a sausage in doublet, hose, and cap, a dumpling waddling off to seek its death by cummerspeck and cake. Go run a lap around the battlements, she pleads, or stretch your chubby legs at least. Put down the fork for Jesus' sake, you fat-ass pork pie wretch. She's right, of course, but still I sniff the cork and pour a goblet full of good red wine. I butter bread and carve the mutton thick. I grease my beard and drink a frothy stein and heat my plate with tarts and spotted dick. My doctor wrings his bird-like hands and cries, oh, that your too, too solid flesh would melt, especially your gut and drumstick thighs. <laughs> I nod, then loosen up my creaking belt. Our kith and kin are passing every day, our world too full of hungry grief and loss. So crack the eggs and whip the fulgent cream, then grate the cheese and lather on the sauce. Unfortunately, this has also become a 
personal mantra of mine. Um, I know you're startled by that fact. And then I, I'm going to read you a couple uh, for, that I actually wrote for and about my daughter. And a, a few of you in here are friends with me on Facebook, and so you've seen some of these posts. But my daughter, who's now seven, um, has, since she was very, very young, said some very startling and they're, they're usually funny, but kind of disturbing things. And I decided uh, about six months ago, I, it, it's high time that I use these to spark some poems. So this first one, the first poem is called Aegis. And the word basically means um, protection, but it also specifically means the shield that Athena held to, to fight people off. Um, and the epigraph, and this is the quote from my daughter when she was four, she said, open your mind, daddy. Open your fat mind. <laughs> so Aegis. And yes, she's probably right. Though I'm sure her sudden zeal for my improvement has nothing to do with transcendental growth, a headline, headlong rush to Zen Satori, or even Buddhist cones that contemplate a forest filled with lonely, voiceless trees and wandering mobs of clapping amputees. Instead, I'm guessing she has arguments lined up like prisoners of war. She barks commands, and they step forward one by one, their uniforms of faded pigeon gray, to tell me why she should get to watch whatever TV show she wants in bed. Caligula, The Wire, The Walking Dead. Or maybe when she orders me to think, to open up my shuttered mind and throw the sashes high, she hopes the light and air will clear the cobwebs out and help me see the truth, that dogs need haircuts too, that cake is perfect as a breakfast food, that schools and baths were always meant for other fools. Of course, she may be thinking, death, sharp knives and cleavers raised to rive my melon head, the neatly sundered halves falling to reveal the tender orange of cantaloupe and seed. It's hard, but maybe that's what daughters do. They crack our skulls and spring away their eyes far focused, clear, and ocean gray. And then another Evie poem. Um, this one's just called Anatomy. And it was a conversation. She jumped into my lap. She was six. This was only last year. She jumped into my lap and started staring in my ear. And I said, why are you doing that? I was pretty worried what the answer would be. And she said, it comforts me to look inside people's bodies. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> That's why I write the poems, to try to figure these things out. So anatomy. Her breath is warm and combs my ear's blank shore, then curls and whistles in its dunes. And I can feel her gaze as she imagines the plunge and turn towards eardrum and the tiny things that thrum beneath, hammer, anvil, stirrup, and farther down the cochlea, a snail who telegraphs the echoes of the world to neurons in the dark. But she sees it all, this underworld of Bosch, and is not dismayed. Perhaps like Madame Curie, she'll light the bones of those who suffer, tracing fractures, breaks, and rifts. The body's black tectonics, pain transformed to light. And like Curie, perhaps she'll find her own Pierre, and there they'll stand among the beakers and the piles of notes. Their hands entwined, they'll watch the skyline fade, Parisian sun engulfed by night. A moon will rise, a dozen vials of radium in racks across the room. She'll watch their glow and wonder at the shadows in her heart. And then I think this is the last of my Evie quote poems. Um, I think I, my wife and I damaged her when she was really young. Um, and that probably is self-apparent by now. Um, but one thing we did, I was teaching a class on genre literature, genre novels. And I, I was, my, my, and my daughter was only a few months old. And I, was, I just didn't have time to reread these books. And so what my wife and I did is we read them to each other, but my daughter Evie was there in the room with us. And so she heard The Shining when she was about three months old. 
and that may have been the irreparable harm that was done. Um, and so this one's called, Why I Shouldn't Have Read My Daughter the Shining. <laughs> and her, her quote that, that, that got me going on this one was, you know the old set saying, Daddy, milk goes with cookies and blood goes with love. <laughs> yeah, I'm, this little Viking's gonna kill me. That's all I know. <laughs> So why I shouldn't have read My Daughter the Shining. Perhaps it's bad we read so much to you when you were small. We turn the lamp down low, a gibbous moon to light the page, then fold the blankets back beneath your chin and hands. And as you dozed, Odysseus the cold plied empty seas, then slipped back home and strung his bow. The suitors fled, but not before he feathered spines and hearts, washed floors in blood. And still we read to you, the Trojan War, the star-crossed trysts, Medea's bloody plans, the ghosts, the poisoned ears and severed tongues, and pain, there's always pain. And you will know that love is something fierce, a hatchet thud upon your door, a madman breaking through. And then a little more seriously, um, well, a lot more seriously, uh, I want to read a couple of poems that I've been working on this summer, so you guys are my, my guinea pigs at this point. Ed, lock the door. Don't let them out. <laughs> so the ink is still kind of wet on these. Um, so some of you guys may have gone on the Bluebell Walk, and it is beautiful, obviously. If you haven't, try to do it before they're all gone. Um, but this one's just called Bluebells. Beneath the old growth, lush with fern and shade, they shroud the ground in violet blue and bring a hush to leaf and limb, the wood's green gown. There is no violence in the bluebell, no clacks and call to arms, no blood. Their crowns and shoulders droop. They knell the hour in every silken bud. Not far away, a girl steps out of frame and isn't found again until the creek is cleared by drought. Bones wreathed in bluebells, she's pinned by stones a noose around her neck. There will be no answers, just grief, that ancient ache that shakes the wreck of mother, father, and all belief. I made that up, by the way. You're not gonna go find the body of a child in the blue <laughs> You guys are like, bluebells! <laughs> How fantastic. <laughs> Um, and this one, um, I'm, I've got kind of a couple of obsessions, and which you've probably seen already tonight. But one of them is uh, the failings of language and how we're unable to communicate sometimes. I mean, even when we know people intimately and for years, all our lives even, um, sometimes words just kind of let us down. So this one's called linguistics. Outside the window, the fractal light of dawn disturbs the woods, its leaves like green syllables speaking in some uninflected tongue. And there too, among the alder and the oak, a liturgy of birdsong bells from tree to tree, dispelling dark like wind dispersing smoke. But what is this to me, or any man whose heart is bent on hopeless things, a smile, a careless touch, a slender fingered hand, the mute world, luminous and unkind, provides no help, no words. Your name remains unvoiced within the silent church of my mind. Meanwhile, the starlings sing on, like flame among the green, and I can imagine that they, like me, can almost speak your name. And I'm just going to read one more. Um, and then after that, if you guys have questions or you want to talk about something specifically in terms of writing creative process or just have questions about the poems, I'm, I'm happy to, to take questions. Um, and this last one is, is fairly new, but I actually ha didn't write it this week. It's just going to sound a little bit like I did. And it's another one. Um, this one's for my daughter, but it's, it's more serious. And it's called Stormlight. Daughter, at times like these, when all the light that's left is fish-kill gray, when cities lean in tumbled blackened piles, their shattered heights pulled down by bombs and fire, 
When refugees form lines at every border, the children chilled by fear and grief, their parents eyeing fences. When oceans rise and pipelines burst, I'm filled with dreams as dark and still as a poisoned well. But often in this gloom, I imagine you, long grown, standing in a field of gold. Your back is straight, rigid as a pew in church, your clear eyes fixed on the horizon. There in roiling clouds that eat the day, the world's malevolence and hate, its pain and discord shroud the sky. And yet you stay, unbowed and brave in this bitter storm light. Behind you in the dust, I sit and write a chronicle of these baffling hurts. I hope to eat the sin to keep you safe at night. Thanks.